Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Anton LaGuardia of The Economist, uh, and I'm uh, here to uh, chair this uh, fascinating session that we'll have with Lord Lawson, uh, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, now uh, Chairman of um, Vote Leave, uh, who will uh, speak for about half an hour to explain his views as to why he should, that uh, Britain will be better off outside. Uh, he wrote not so long ago, uh, when asked what is the alternative to the European Union, he said a more foolish question is hard to imagine. The alternative to being out of the, to, to the European Union is not being in the European Union. Um, uh, I, I uh, have two things to ask you. Firstly, we're on the record for any journalists in the room. Uh, secondly, there is a hashtag uh, for anybody who wants to tweet the session. Um, and then after that, we'll move briskly on to questions. Uh, and I hope uh, that uh, you will have lots of questions ready. Keep them concise, please, and to the point, and we'll get as many people in as possible. Lord Lawson, the floor is yours. Well, it's very great to, good to be here, and it's always a privilege to speak at the hallowed institution of Chatham House. The last time I did so was 27 years ago. <laughs> so you don't invite me very often. <laughs> and I doubt if the events will allow me to come here in another 27 years' time. So this may be the last time I'm here. Uh, it was during my final year as Chancellor of the Exchequer when I chose to speak about Britain and the European community, as it was then known. This was before the advent of European Monetary Union. Indeed, it was before the publication of the Delors Report, which was to set out the proposals for monetary union. But it was already clear what that report would conclude. And I made clear my opposition to it, the first such speech by a British minister. If I may quote what I said then, economic and monetary union is incompatible with independent sovereign states with control over their own fiscal and monetary policies. Monetary decisions would be taken not by national governments and or central banks, but by a European central bank. Nor would individual countries be able to retain responsibility for fiscal policy. It is clear that economic and monetary union implies nothing less than a European government, albeit a federal one, and political union, you, the United States of Europe. That is what I said here 27 years ago, and I think it stands up. And this has, of course, been endorsed most recently by the uh, European Union so-called Five Presidents Report on the completion of monetary union, which calls for the creation of a single Eurozone finance ministry headed by a single Eurozone finance minister by 2025. And it's also what all economic history tells us. There's not a single major monetary union in the world that is not also a fiscal union and a political union. The economic and political logic is incontrovertible. And that, of course, is why European Monetary Union has so far proved one of the greatest economic and political disasters of our time. But in a sense, it was designed to fail. Uh, Jacques Delors, whom I knew very well when as French finance minister, he was my opposite number in the European Community's ECOFIN Council and elsewhere, was well aware that it could make sense only as a stepping stone to political union. It was a colossal, and some might say, grossly irresponsible gamble, not least because the lesson of history is that monetary union invariably follows rather than precedes political union. That was the case, to cite just three examples, with the United States monetary union, the German monetary union, and the Italian Monetary Union. So the first and most important reason for Brexit is that the European Union is a political project whose overriding objective is the one, which we, one that we in Britain do not share. Curiously, in this country, unlike on the continent where I now live, there is a reluctance to believe that politics can trump 
economics. I will, of course, discuss the economics, but let's be under no illusion. This is a political and not an economic enterprise. That is what Ever Closer Union is all about. In his letter to the Prime Minister ahead of last weekend's charade of a negotiation, EU President Tusk declared that, and I quote, references in the treaties and their preambles to the process of creating an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe are primarily intended to signal that the union's aim is to promote trust and understanding among peoples living in open and democratic societies sharing a common heritage of universal values. End of quote. It has to be said that this is so deliberately misleading that it might have been drafted by our own dear Foreign Office. <laughs> uh, the, the solemn declaration on European Union, which was concluded at Stuttgart in 1983, commits EU members to an ever, and I quote, an ever closer union of the peoples and member states of the European Union. And this has never been revoked or even raised, it seems, by David Cameron during the current so-called negotiations. In other words, we remain unwilling passengers in the back of a car driven by others to a destination which we vehemently wish not to reach. The Prime Minister claims, of course, that we've secured an opt-out from ever closer union, and that's from political union. That's nothing new in the important sense that our non-membership of the Eurozone had already established that. But this is little comfort, since we continue to be fully subject to present and future EU legislation driven by the objective of full-blooded political union. Moreover, almost all EU decisions nowadays are taken by qualified majority. And since the recent revision of voting weights, the Eurozone caucus within the EU enjoys an inbuilt qualified majority. Not that even before that we had anything like the influence within the EU, which the Foreign Office has always sought to pretend. Uh, for example, over the past 20 years, there have been 72 occasions in the Council of Ministers on which the United Kingdom has opposed a particular measure. On each and every one of those occasions, we have lost. A scoreline of nil 72 is not very impressive. What then of the economics? Is there a powerful economic case for our remaining in the European Union despite our fundamental disagreement with its overriding political objective? And I'm not saying for a moment that this political objective is wicked, but it is simply not one which we share. Uh, the answer has to be that there is no economic case. The EU with its single market is the slowest growing economic bloc in the world, and there is no reason to believe that this is going to change. This is partly because of the dysfunctional single currency, and partly of, because of the deep-seated unwillingness to undertake the sort of structural reforms which we in this country put in place during the Thatcher era. Meanwhile, despite the rebate of our net financial contribution to the EU, which was secured by Margaret Thatcher, it still costs us some £10 billion a year, year in, year out, to belong to the club. That's money we pay and never see in any form again. Money that could be much better spent on our own national priorities. The gross subscription, of course, is almost twice as much, some £700 a year, year in, year out, from every household in the land. Even more costly is the burden of EU regulation, particularly damaging to our small and medium-sized businesses, which are so important to the economy. This has been reliably calculated at getting on for £25 billion a year. And the flood of new... EU regulation is unceasing, partly because it is an article of EU faith that, quote, more Europe must ipso facto be a good thing, and more Europe is all too often interpreted as more EU regulation. It's perfectly true that Whitehall, too, is capable of engaging in excessive 
regulations, not all Brussels. But the fundamental difference is that unnecessary or undesirable indigenous regulation can be repealed as it was during the 1980s when I was in government. By contrast, EU regulation is untouchable. Nor, despite lip service being paid to the notion of sub subsidiarity, is there ever any transfer of competence back from the EU to the member states? Never. The principle of the acquis communautaire is absolute. The ratchet is irreversible. In his seminal Bloomberg speech three years ago, the Prime Minister announced his objective of securing, and I quote, fundamental far-reaching reform of the European Union, including an end to the ratchet. I'm sure he did his best, but he has failed completely. The European Union, about which we will be voting on 23rd of June, is not only wholly unreformed, it has proved itself to be unreformable. Instead of the fundamental reform he explicitly sought, the Prime Minister has been obliged to fall back on an exercise in damage limitation. How to limit the damage that EU membership inflicts on us. The most that he's been able to get our partners to agree to is what he likes to call a red card. What this consists of is an agreement that in the unlikely event, and it is unlikely, of our being able to secure the agreement of at least 55% of the European Union to oppose a measure which we believe to be damaging to the United Kingdom, and then only on the grounds of subsidiarity, the Europe EU presidency would put the matter on the agenda for, and I quote, a comprehensive discussion. Some red card. What then of the claim that it is imperative for us to retain what is referred to as access to the single market? And that EU regulation is a price that has to be paid for this, whether we're inside the EU or out of it. The claim is totally confused on at least two grounds. In the first place, exporters to the EU market obviously have to conform to EU regulations just as exporters to the United States have to conform to US regulations and so on around the world. But less than 15% and declining of the British economy consists of exports to the European Union. The other 85% plus consists of exports to the rest of the world, more than 15% and rising, and preponderantly, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises, many of which do not export at all, business within the United Kingdom. We are, after all, the fifth largest economy in the world. Brexit means that we would no longer suffer the heavy burden of EU regulation on the 85% and more of our economy that doesn't consist of exports to the so-called single market. The second is that under the terms of the World Trade Organization, of which I'll say a little bit more in a moment, we would enjoy access to the single market, whether we were or not we were a member of the union ourselves. Uh, the United Kingdom, for example, imports goods from all over the world, and not exclusively from our fellow members of the European Union, and so it is for the rest of the European Union. That's because we live happily in a relatively free trading world. So what is meant by access to the single market is presumably tariff-free access. That would be desirable, but it's by no means essential. The European Union's common external tariff has a weighted average of somewhere between 3% and 4%, which is hardly a massive burden. However, it is implausible in the extreme that we wouldn't be able to negotiate a free trade agreement once outside. Indeed, German industry, for one, would insist on it, not least the powerful German motor industry, for whom the United Kingdom is far and away their largest export market. Overall, we are the rest of the EU's most important market, taking some 300 billion pounds of their goods and services uh, a year, far more than we sell to them. 
And since we are so big, our bilateral deal would inevitably be better than those secured by little Switzerland and even smaller Norway, not that either of those two successful countries have suffered from being outside the European Union. The myopic little Europeans in our midst frequently ask those of us who wish to see this country leave the European Un Union is uh, precisely what is our alternative to EU membership. And as the chairman uh, in his introduction uh, pointed out, I've already explained that the short answer is that the alternative to being in the EU is not being in the EU. Uh, it may come as a great shock to the little Europeans that most of the world is not in the European <laughs> Union. And most of these countries are doing much better than most of the European Union. I have, I have already sketched out uh, part of what it might, all this might imply for the UK. But there is, of course, much more. For example, outside the EU, we would be able to resume our full membership of the World Trade Organization, which we have had to forfeit as a member of the European Union, able to negotiate free trade agreements with countries outside Europe, as Switzerland, for example, has done with great success, and generally act as a force for liberalization within the WTO. On the regulatory front, having repealed the European Communities Act, which establishes the primacy of EU law over our own UK law, all the existing laws and regulations which emanated from Brussels would initially remain in place as UK laws and regulations. But, and this is the political nub of it, the UK government and parliament will then be free to decide which to retain, which to repeal, and which to amend. More generally, the Prime Minister has made it clear that whatever the result of the referendum, he will implement the decision of the British people, which I am confident he would do in good faith with the full backing of the Cabinet and of our excellent civil service. If, as I hope, the decision is to leave the European Union, we can be confident that that decision will be implemented smoothly and effectively. The present Foreign Secretary has rather shamefully, in my mind, to my mind, tried to scare the British people by saying that if we leave, our former partners will combine to punish us. There is no legal way in which they can do this. More importantly, it wouldn't be in their interest to do so. But if we were to vote to remain within the EU, then they would indeed be legally able to punish us, and it might well be in their interest to do so. There is seldom gratitude in politics. Uh, <clears throat> when some three years ago, I first came out publicly in favor of Brexit, in a long article in the Times, the Financial Times' principal <coughs> EU commentator, in a column agreeably entitled Lord Lawson is Right, uh, uh, not, a, not a heading I see all that often, uh, <laughs> concluded with these words, and I quote, there may be reasons why the e UK may wish to remain in the EU, but whatever they are, they are not economic. In the light of the unbelievably insubstantial nature of the changes secured by the Prime Minister, I suspect that we are likely to hear more from those arguing that we should remain in the EU about the alleged non-economic benefits of EU membership. In particular, we will be told, and we already are being told, that it is necessary for our security in a dangerous world. Well, it's certainly true that we live in a dangerous world and that security is of the first importance. But this has nothing whatever to do with either the European Union or our membership of it. What it has got to do with is NATO, of which we're a leading member and the only major EU country with a commitment to spend 2% of GDP on defense, plus our special intelligence relationship with the United States, and the wider Five Eyes Intelligence Agreement, which also includes Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, which is crucial for our ability to defend our people against terrorists. None of these countries were members of the European Union when I last checked. The world we live in today 
is a very different one from that of 1973, when we joined what was then known as the common market. Britain today is the very opposite of the sick man of Europe, which we were then. Germany has been peacefully reunited and has forsworn any militaristic ambitions. The Soviet Union is no more, and the world economy has been transformed by the coming of globalization with the emerging economies of Asia, Latin America, and much of Africa steadily catching up with the West as they abandon socialist e economics and embrace the market economy. That is the world of today and tomorrow, which this country, freed from the constraints of the European Union, has the ability to take the greatest advantage of. Indeed, our own Foreign Office, in its 2013 Balance of Competences report, has documented how and why there is no other European nation which has comparable global potential, from our membership of the Commonwealth to the fact of English being the world's language, from our bilateral relationships with key members of our former empire to London's position, which again knows, knows nothing to EU membership as the world's foremost global financial center. Indeed, London remains threatened by misguided EU legislation, not least the proposed financial transactions tax, which Chancellor George Osborne has fought vainly to get declared illegal. It is, of course, true that London is helped by being in the European time zone, but do you know, That'll still be the case if and when we leave the European Union. <laughs> and just as the issue before us today is not about the European time zone, so it is not about Europe as such. The European Union is not Europe. It is one episode in Europe's long and remarkable history, and one that has long since served any useful purpose it may have had. For my, for my own part, I not only love this country, I also love France, which is why I have chosen to live there. The issue before us isn't whether you like Europe or not. It is about a relatively recent institution in Brit Europe's remarkable history, the European Union, and Britain's relationship with it. So to suggest that, at least for the UK and possibly for others too, this institution is now well past its sell-by date, is in no sense to be anti-European. So I've explained why, in my considered opinion, EU membership is on balance, economically harmful to the UK, and why the economic future for us is global. But at the end of the day, the issue before us is a much more fundamental one than that. The European Union suffers not only from a bureaucratic surplus, it also has as is widely accepted, a serious democratic deficit. Those who are committed to the European project, the creation of a full-blooded political union, see this as simply a transitional phase. Once the United States of Europe has been achieved, it will, of course, be a democracy. Maybe, maybe, although, as David Cameron rightly observed in his Bloomberg speech, there is no genuine European demos whereas there is, of course, a very real British, and for that matter, French, demos. But what is abundantly clear is that the EU as we know it now is profoundly undemocratic. Indeed, one of the most attract unattractive aspects of the European integrationist movement is its contempt for democracy. The eurocracy know what is best for the people, and if the people have the temerity to vote the wrong way in a referendum, they're frequently told that they must vote again. This is a matter of concern to many people throughout the European Union, but it is a particular matter of concern in this country with our addiction to freedom and democracy. And it is intimately connected with something even older and even more fundamental, self-government which incidentally includes control of our own borders, which we cannot enjoy so long as we remain within the European Union. Membership of the European Union, however well-intentioned, is an affront to self-government, and it offers nothing that remotely compensates for this. What the British people want, I believe, and what we now have in our grasp, is a genuinely global future as a self-governing democracy. We have within our 
grasp a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to seize control of our own destiny, to be free, to prosper, and to stand tall. I leave you with one last thought. If we were not now a member of the European Union, would the British people vote to join it? I believe, I believe that the answer emphatically is no, in which case it's clear that whatever the short-term hassle, we should leave. There are, in conclusion, three possible destinies for our country. We could, as most of big business and big banking were calling for not so long ago, give up our currency, join the euro, and accept being part of a federal United States of Europe. We could, as David Cameron is now recommending, keep the pound sterling and stay out of the European political union, but remain shackled to it, a sort of colonial status. Or we could, as I would urge, make the 23rd of June 2016 the date of Britain's declaration of independence and vote to leave the European Union. That is the case for Brexit.